in 2000, Yeltsin was no longer president and Vladimir Putin became president. Yeah. You did a series of interviews with Vladimir Putin, as you mentioned, over a period of two years, from 2015 to 2017. Let's, let me ask with a high level question. What was your goal with that conversation? Oh, uh, came out in 2017. I guess I started them in 2014. At that point, the Snowden affair had happened. And I was working on a movie on Snowden. That happened in 13. Uh, Ukraine uh, happened in 14. And uh, one thing after another, by, by 14, Putin was enemy number, again, becoming a, a wanted man on the American list. He was enemy, he was certainly in the top five. Or, uh, and, but the, the animosity towards Putin had been growing since 2007 at Munich. I remember that speech when he made it. Uh, it's in my documentary. That's a four-hour documentary, four different conversations. I mean, we talked over two years, two and a half years. But I remember that image of him at Munich making a very important speech about world harmony, about the balance necessary in the world. And I remember the sneer, the sneer on John McCain's face. He was in Munich, obviously eyeballing Putin and hating him. And it was so evident that McCain had no belief whatsoever that the that this, he was almost treating him like, these are the communists are back. And we know that Putin was not a communist. We know that Putin is very much a market man. And he made no he, he made it very clear and tried to keep an open climate, a new relationship with Europe. But the United States always certain people in the United States always saw that as a threat, like Putin is trying to take Europe away from us as if we own it, as if we have the right to own it. But Putin was making the point, it's very important about sovereignty. And sovereignty for uh, countries is crucial to, for, for this new world to have balance. That's sovereignty for China, sovereignty for Russia, sovereignty for Iran, sovereignty for Venezuela, sovereignty for Cuba. This is an idea that's crucial to the new world, and I think the United States has never accepted that. It, it, sovereignty is not an idea that they can allow. They, You have to be ob obedient to the United States idea of so-called democracy and uh, freedom. But the, it's uh, much more important is sovereignty for these countries. And the United States has not obeyed that, has not, uh, has not even uh, acknowledged it. And it never comes up. So from the perspective of the United States, when power centers arise in the world, yes, you start to oppose those, uh, well, big, because, not because of the ideas, but because they have, but merely because they have power. Isn't that at the heart of the doctrine of the uh, neoconservatives? In the new, the Pact for the New American Century, they wrote that in 1996-7. They said, there shall be no emergence of a rival power. It was very clear it was about power. And they have, uh, they've stuck to that doctrine, which is if you, if you start to get dangerous in any way or have power, we're going to knock you out. Now that won't work, but I, I don't believe it can work. And that is a, fortunately a, fo a policy the United States is following. And uh, the neoconservatives group, which is very small, but it's very strong apparently, and their idea has resonated. It was, it was behind the George Bush's invasion of Iraq. It was part of not only Iraq, but cleaning out the whole world, draining the swamp, going to Afghanistan first. And then although, Iraq had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda's attack going after Iraq. And of course, 60 some other countries that where terrorism had some, had some uh, signs of, they were, wherever America judged would be a dangerous country. We had the right, you're either with us or against us. Now that is a disastrous policy and led to one thing after another. The Iraq war never learned a lesson the neoconservatives were never fired, never thrown out of office. The people who prosecuted that war are still around. Many of them are still around, and they're, they're obviously guiding America now. Let me return to the, this question of power. Don't forget the, the sneer that I saw there. I, yeah. That emblemized the United States reaction. Also, there were several other American representatives who were laughing, kind of mocking uh, Putin, who was very serious. I, I felt... It was a divide there. So, in since then, I mean, in a certain sense, the Europe, 
reaction to Putin is crucial. And they were they were more with him back then. Yeah. And a big thing for America was always to keep NATO, to keep Europe in, in its pocket as a satellite. And with this recent war, of course, they've succeeded in, in all beyond their dreams. Of, of, the Russians have fi- fulfilled the fantasy of the United States yeah. to finally be this aggressor that they have pictured for years. Yeah. We can talk about that later. But at that time, there was uh, Europe had significant support for Putin. Yes. And the United States was sneering at Putin. Was, That's correct. You can say that. And then, so there's this, um, it, it was, um, there was uncertainty as to the direction, as to the future of Russia. And that's exactly when you interviewed Vladimir Putin. I wanted to know what they thought, because we couldn't get the, 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 in, the information war that the United States was fighting against Russia was in evidence back then. It was full out. The, uh, the condemnation of Russia on all fronts. Uh, I never saw a positive article about Putin. And although when I traveled in the world and I traveled a lot doing documentaries, it was very clear in the Middle East, in Africa, in other, in Asia, there was respect for him, that he was a man who was getting job, his job done in the interests of Russia. He was, as I said in the documentary, a son of Russia, very much so, in, a, in, a, in the positive sense, a son, a, a son of Russia. Not that he's out there trying to... Uh, destroy the interests of other of other countries no that he was out there to sell the promote the interests of russia but at the same time keep a balance keep it keep it keep the world into a harmony this has always been his picture peace was always his idea in other words he always referred to the united states in all these interviews as our partners and i said will you stop using that word they're not well and he was a little bit slow in waking up to uh, what the united states was doing well that said, he's one of the most powerful men in the world. He was at that time. And let me ask you the human question. As the old adage goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Did you see any corroding effects of power on the man? Forget the political leader, on just the human being that carries that power on his shoulders for so many years. Keep in mind that he's been, un, unlike most modern leaders, he's been in office off and on because of, there was a Medvedev was president and he was not literally in charge. He was, he was, he was, uh, he took another appointment at that point and he, but he was still very much involved. But for 20 years, more or less, he's been at the administrator of the state, the protector of the state. And he's apparently done a good enough job that the Russian people have kept him there. Because contrary to what many people think, I really believe that if the Russian people didn't want him, he would be out. I firmly believe that. I don't think you can let, you can go against the will of the people. Now, it expresses itself in many ways, at the ballot box and so forth, but also in other ways in Russia. There's a strong currents of opinion. So contrary to what the, the, the position of him as a dictator, he wouldn't last if he was unpopular, number one. Number two, Russia is much more divided than people know. There's other factors in Russia. He is, there's, there are always tensions in, in, in around the Kremlin, who, who has power, who doesn't have power. That's been going on for a hundred years. But the, the factions in Russia are very much there. So when people refer to Russia as Putin, they're, they're mistaken. When, and they do this regularly in the New York uh, papers and all this. They say, Putin did this, Putin did that, Putin's doing that. But it's Russia that's doing it. And that's what, uh, there's a distinction there that I, it's changed. In the old days, uh, I would read about Khrushchev, but it was never Khrushchev personally. It was about the Soviet Union. Uh, there was respect for a country. And now, when it started to get personal with Putin, it, it changed, it, it, and the, our thinking changed in a, in a negative way. We we no longer respected it as a country. We were seen it as a man, and the man we had trashed repeatedly, repeatedly as a poisoner, as a murderer, and none of which has ever been proven, but which has always been repeated and repeated to the point at which it becomes like an Orwell mantra. It becomes like he is, of course, the bad guy. Can I just ask you, as a great filmmaker, as a human being, what was it like talking to one of the most powerful men in the world? 
for honestly, and I'm not naive. I've talked to a lot of powerful people. In the movie business, there are powerful people, yes. and many of them are corrupted. I've talked to many people in my life. I've been in the military. I'm, I've seen, I've had other jobs. I have to say, I found him to be a human being. I just found him to be reasonable, calm. I never saw him lose his temper. And I mean, you have to understand that most people in the, most people in the Western way of doing business get emotional. I don't see that. I saw him as a balanced man, as a man who had studied this like you had. There's a calmness to you that it comes from studying the world and having a rational response to it. His, his, it's interesting, his two daughters, one of them is very scientific and the, the other one's doing very well in another profession, but they, they, they're, thinking, they're a thinking family. His wife too was. Uh, I can't talk for the new wife because I don't know about it, but he's, he kept his family with great respect. He's raised his, his daughters right. He served Yeltsin the way he looked at it. He served Yeltsin well, and he and he st and he never trashed well uh, Yeltsin. Certainly, a lot of people did. But you know, I asked him repeatedly. You know, was he an alcoholic? This or that? But he he wouldn't even go that far. He just respect. And this man Yeltsin was in it was uh, in many ways um, ridiculed, but in by the Russians and. He turned over the power because he felt like he was overwhelmed. He turned over the power to this man because why? How many people had he fired before him? Several, several prime ministers, this, that. Why did he turn power over to, to uh, Mr. Putin? Because he respected him for his work ethic and his balance, his maturity. And that's what I can say is I saw in him. A, a, a poor person, a poor from a poor family who worked his way up, through the KGB, Americans keep saying he's a KGB agent, but I, it's, it's like saying, you know, George Bush was a CIA agent, but, you know, he became a, you grow, you grow in your life. And he went from the KGB to this technocratic position. He, re, he dealt with many uh, problems, inc including the Chechnyan war, which is a, a very difficult situation, as well as the Russian submarine problem. Several things happened early in his that balance that gave him a lot of experience, and he handled them all pretty well. Do you think he was an honest man? I do. Now, of course, the question of money, I've, the charges that he's the richest man in the world are ludicrous. Uh, he certainly doesn't live like it or act like it. If you're rich, I've I've, I've been around a lot of rich people in my life. You'd probably have too. In America, you run into yes. them. So many of them are arrogant. I'm actually uh, good friends now with the richest man in the world. Oh, of course. I saw your interview with <laughs> Mr. Uh, Musk, who I, I appreciate. At least he speaks freely. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm positive about him owning Twitter because Twitter has become censorship uh, city, as has all the major tech I mean, the censorship that we are now seeing in the United States is so un-American and shocking to me. And he is a resistance to that. That is true. Yeah, I like I like Musk for that, just for that only. But I also appreciate him, his adventuresome, his nature and his desire to, to, to explore the world and to ask questions. Yeah, there's certain ways you sound when you speak freely. Hmm? There's certain ways you sound, a man sounds when he speaks freely. Yeah. And he speaks freely and it's refreshing. Yeah. No matter whether you're rich or not, it doesn't matter. When you speak freely, it's a beautiful Actually, thing. Actually, uh, Musk, uh, a major point on going back to nuclear energy, mm -hmm. you know, he was, he never believed in it at first, apparently. Uh, mm -hmm. He was going for batteries, right? And mm -hmm. he did a, put a lot of money into batteries. He made them bigger and bigger batteries. But it just, well, as Bill Gates has said, it's just, it, it's not going to get us there. Yeah. And uh, now I think Musk is on another path. He understands the need for nuclear. Yeah, he's a supporter of nuclear. <sighs> We're jumping around. Putin never asked for one thing, never. It was an interview, it was free form. Ask anything you want. No, no restrictions, no rules. As with Castro, frankly, Castro did the same thing as did Chavez. So I've had good luck in interviewing free-ranging subjects, people willing to express themselves. He's much more guarded than Castro or uh, Chavez, because as you know, he, he's, he's setting government policy when he speaks, and anything he says is, can be taken out of context. But there was no restrictions on what to talk about, no, none of that. Nor any desire to see anything before we published it. No need to check it with them. It, it was a 
completely. <laughs> do you think he watched the final product? Yes, I do, but I don't think he made judgments on it. I think he was pleased. I'm, he doesn't go either way. You see, he's, very, it's, he's pleased. I mean, it went well. He's happy for us. And, mm -hmm. But I don't think he had great enthusiasm uh, expressed it to me. And he trusted me. And you can see the way he dealt with me each time. He warmed up to me. Uh, four times, you know, the first time I might have been a little stiff. Uh, you're asking, uh, you don't know what, who you're dealing with and mm -hmm. so forth. I understand that. But he's used to it now. He's, he's done a lot of press. The worst press he's done frankly, has been the American press, and not because of his fault, but because of the way they have treated him. If you look at the interviews, they're awful. They put, first of all, I, I noticed one thing as a filmmaker right away, they use a dub, an overdub. They put a Russian speaker yeah. for everything he says, who's much harsher. He speaks Russian in a much harsher manner than actually Putin does, yeah. who's very, if you, on my interview, I left him in his original language mm -hmm. with translator, and I think that's important because he expresses himself very clearly and calmly. The, the, uh, when you listen to the American broadcast, it's a belligerent person who looks like he's about to bang his shoe on the table. Uh, and secondly, the questions are highly aggressive from the beginning. There's no, there's no sense of rapport. There's no sense of, uh, well, it's why, Mr. Putin, did you poison this person? Why, Mr. Putin, did you kill this person? Why are you a murderer? I mean, it's, it's blunt, blunt negative television. Yeah, it's not just aggressive. So I obviously speak Russian, uh, so I get to appreciate both the original and the translation. And uh, it's not just aggressive, it's very shallow. No. They're not looking to understand. No. To me, aggression is okay if that's the way you wanna approach it, but it should be, there should be underlying kind of empathy for another human being in order to be able to understand. And and so, the the some of the worst interviews I've ever listened to is by American press of Vladimir Putin. So NBC uh, uh, and all those kinds of organizations. It's very painful to watch. Um, and you saw the reception to the Putin interviews in America was hostile without seeing it. So many people uh, criticized my series without having seen it. Even even I, w I went on a show, a television show with this famous uh, Colbert. You know, he's very famous in America. And I was shocked on the show to find out that he hadn't seen anything of the four hours. He was just attacking Putin. And he threw me. I was complicit, therefore I was a I was a Putin supporter. And he the show the show was a disaster. It's it's one of my worst television shows. I actually I had to just shut up and get off the air. I mean, at some point it was embarrassing. I, because the audience too was clapping for Colbert on anything he said. Well, as an interviewer in that situation, because between you and, and Vladimir Putin, there was camaraderie, there was joking, there was, yeah. are you worried, do you put that into the calculation when you're making a film with somebody that could be lying to you, that could be evil, when you talk about Castro, you talk about, so are you worried about how, how charisma of a man across the table from you can uh No, I take you? that into account. I absolutely take that into account. I know, I mean, doing Castro, is, he's a wonderful speaker. He's charismatic. So is Chavez. Think, yes. Look at those interviews. I took it into account, but Putin doesn't play that game. He doesn't charm you. He doesn't try to overwhelm you with his... Uh, Bon ami at all. He just says, okay, ask your question, I'll give you my answer straight. Here it is. This, and he analyzes it. This is the history of NATO. This is the history of our relationship with the United States. How many times have we tried to talk to them about such and such and such and such? And each time we get nowhere. In fact, it's a very, I would like to get along with the United States so much. He's saying it, he's saying it so clearly in all his words. So, to play devil's advocate. But he's not making a big deal about it. But there is a charisma and the calmness. Yes, there is. So like, let's just calm everything down. It's simple facts. That you can, yes. you can, you can call, um, so there's like the Hitler thing, which is screaming, being very loud, charismatic, strong message and so on. And then there's a Putin style, I'm not comparing those two. There's the Putin <laughs> style communication of calmness. Yeah. And and that, at least to me, my personality, that can be very captivating. 
is bringing everything down. The facts are simple. But then when you say the facts are simple, you can now start lying. And you don't know what's true and what's lies. Well, it, it behooves you to do some research. Yes. And frankly, when coming to research, you're gonna have a problem because if you go to the Americanized yes. versions of Russian history, you're gonna run into a problem. And that includes even Wikipedia. They will tell you things that are just not factually supported. So it was a problem in terms of, if you read all the books in the American the library about Putin, there's nothing positive about it. Uh, they're awful, they're awful. And a lot of them, uh, I, sp I had a good relationship with Professor Stephen Cohen, who's the most, in I think one of the most informed men on Russia. He'd done a lot of research all his life and uh, knew Gorbachev very well and was very ana analytical about all these situations that happened before his death in uh, 2019. I'm not quite sure when Stephen died, but I knew him well. And uh, he was the he gave me the best information I could get. I would go to Stephen and I'd say, I'm confused here. Tell me the history of this uh, accusation of poisoning against this person and so forth. And he'd explain it to me in I think very, the clearest ways that I understood. And he said to me once, he said, most of these people who go to Russia and write this stuff about Putin are going off the internet. The internet has really been a, a source of a lot of fractured facts here. Uh, he said, pure analysis. You have to go back to the texts, all the documents, and to really fully understand. But he, under, he, want, he spoke Russian, and his wife and him, uh, Katerina, uh, Katerina uh, Van Heuvel, uh, who's an editor, uh, publisher of uh, The Nation magazine, would go to Russia several times a year and talk to their friend Gorbachev. And Gorbachev's an interesting character. I've talked to him, interviewed him, not interviewed him, but talked to him at length, and I like him very much. And I saw the divide, as you saw in the Putin interviews between Gorbachev and Putin early on in the interviews. You sense Putin doesn't particularly care for Gorbachev because he, in his point of view, he screwed up the administration of, of Russia and is responsible for so much of the disaster of leaving all those people outside the Soviet Union. Uh, so so it, it, these are problems that continue into the future. But he... At the they see each other at the or he sees he knows he's there at the May Day Parade. I, I, I we filmed, and uh, he's his he his attitude is funny. It's very human. He says, "I you know he's welcome. He's got his he's got he's pension. He's a pensioner. He's done his duty. He's there's no there's no uh, animus towards him." Even when Gorbachev in the early days, as you remember, criticized him for his manners in terms of democracy. But I don't know that that you know that becomes a quarrel. But frankly, by the by the end of the situation, uh, it's very clear that Gorbachev has now moved closer and closer to the says that Russia is now really under attack. This is he sees it. He sees where the United States has made a concerted effort to undermine Putin, and he does. And as he's repeated this several times about Ukraine, I think you've seen what he said. You can quote it. And Gorbachev is, a, we have no respect for Gorbachev even, even at this juncture. When can you see Gorbachev's ideas printed in most American newspapers? Very rarely, very rarely, and not, and recently not at all. So Gorbachev, who was our hero back in, in the American hero back in 1980s, 80s, has now been condemned to the garbage can, so to speak, of history.